Welcome back to the Jake Beckett Show podcast. I'm your host, Jake Beckett, back in the house for another great episode this week. We are continuing with our Great Men of History series. I'm really pumped about this one. Um, you know, this this one's long overdue. I'm sure a lot of you uh, who know me were wondering when this one was going to happen. Uh, we're finally going to do an episode on my favorite American, George Washington. And this is such an extensive subject matter, someone who I have such a tremendous amount of respect for. Uh, we're going to go deep on this one. So it's going to be a three-part series on George Washington. I decided to break this down uh, into three distinct episodes. The first episode, this episode, is going to cover uh, Washington's early life up until the American Revolution. Part two is going to be a comprehensive deep dive on Washington's role as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. Uh, and then part three is going to be the the, uh, the time after the war, before the Constitution, uh, the Articles of Confederation, uh, then his time as the first president of the United States, uh, and then his later life uh, at Mount Vernon and his death in 1799 and his overall legacy. Um, but let's, without further ado, let's get started on part one. So George Washington, you know, um, he, he truly is uh, one of the great men of all history. Uh, in my opinion, he's the greatest American. He's the greatest American president. Uh, he really was the indispensable man. In many ways, he was uh, early America. He's the father of our country. Uh, he was the indispensable man of the revolution. Um, I, and I think all of this is captured. Let's begin with a quote. One of my favorite quotes um, about George Washington, this came from Major General Henry Lee, Light Horse Harry Lee, who uh, served as a general, an adjutant on Washington's staff uh, during the war. Uh, Light Horse Harry Lee uh, was the father of General Robert E. Lee, who, of course, commanded the Army of Northern Virginia uh, for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Um, and one, he, he was one of the, the, founding, the founding fathers of, of colonial Virginia um, in the, the Virginia, the, the state of Virginia. Uh, and his, his quote was, uh, it was written, it was a, a written eulogy to George Washington upon his death in 1799. And the quote from, from Light Horse Harry Lee was, Washington was first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. I love that quote. I really think it captures everything about the essence of Washington. He truly was, as I said before, I'll say it again, he was the indispensable man. Uh, the, the American Revolution never would have succeeded without George Washington. The country never would have been founded without George Washington. Uh, our, our small r Republican form of government never would have taken place, uh, never would have been established without George Washington. Uh, as we'll get into the Newburgh conspiracy and, and other, um, you know, it's, it's not very well understood that there were many people who were urging, in fact, begging uh, George Washington to take the crown. Uh, to become a king, uh, notably Alexander Hamilton, who was on Washington's staff, uh, was urging him to do that. Many of the officers of the American Revolution uh, were urging him to become king, and he decided not to. We'll get into those reasons why, uh, but that'll be in, in, in later episodes. Um, but this first episode, you know, where else to begin? And in 1732, in Colonial Virginia, is where uh, George Washington was born. He was the son of Augustine Washington and Mary Ball Washington. Uh, he was the oldest of their six children. Augustine Washington had four children from a previous marriage. His first wife had died. Uh, and so Augustine had four uh, children from that marriage, uh, which he brought into the family uh, with Mary Ball Washington. So Washington, he was the oldest of six uh, blood siblings, and then he had four older half-siblings, um, and most notably among those four um, was Lawrence Washington, uh, who was 14 years older than George, and he became kind of a surrogate father figure to George, and he was an early mentor, an inspiration. Uh, Augustine Washington, George's father, died in 1738 when George was only six years old, um, so, so Lawrence really stepped in as that surrogate father figure. Um, Lawrence was a, a very uh, successful man in his own right. Um, he was a, an officer in the uh, Virginia colonial militia. Um, you know, he, he really raised George in a lot of ways. And this, they had a very special relationship. Um, you know, it was, 
It was noted that in his, uh, in his study at Mount Vernon, uh, George only kept one portrait in there, uh, and that was a portrait of Lawrence. Um, you know, Washington's early writings and correspondence make a lot of references to Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence was very special to him, and, and tragically, uh, Lawrence died too young. Uh, he died in 1752 of uh, tuberculosis, what they called back in the day the White Plague. Washington um, traveled. The, the only time Washington ever left uh, America uh, was when he traveled with Lawrence to Barbados in the Caribbean, um, where, where Lawrence was hoping to regain his health. Uh, he tragically did not. He succumbed uh, to tuberculosis and died at Mount Vernon in 1752. But anyway, um, Lawrence was, and as we'll, as we'll see, you know, Lawrence was a, an officer um, serving with serving the crown and the colonies um, in, in some of the early conflicts uh, in early America. Um, he, he was who inspired George to follow a similar path uh, to join the uh, colonial militia in service of Great Britain. Um, and, and we'll, we'll get into some of those details. So, so George, as a young man, as a boy, um, he was raised by uh, his older siblings and his mother. Uh, his mother actually lived quite a long time. Um, she died. Uh, she, she lived to old age. And uh, George and his mother, uh, Martha Ball Washington, always had kind of a tough relationship. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, first of all, just let me back up. I recommend there's two sources that I'm primarily going to rely upon um, for these podcasts two excellent uh, biographies of George Washington, first by Ron Chernow, uh, Washington, A Life, um, and then uh, Joseph Ellis's uh, His Excellency, George Washington. Uh, that, was, that was Washington's title uh, from, for most of his life after he became commander-in-chief. He was, he was always referred to as His Excellency. Um, those are two outstanding single-volume biographies. If you're looking for more information, I highly recommend reading those two biographies if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, George, uh, as a young man, uh, he, he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his older half-brother Lawrence um, and serve in the colonial militia. And that's, that's what he did. Uh, he was a surveyor by trade. Um, you know, Augustine was uh, fairly successful um, as a farmer and a planter. Um, and he, uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, also encouraged George to take up surveying. Uh, Washington, at, at a very young age, therefore had experience with the topography of early America, which served him well during the American Revolution. Uh, he, he gained experience as an outdoorsman. Uh, he was always very tough, very strong. Uh, there are a lot of stories told about his feats of strength. It's also important to note that Washington was a very large man, uh, uh, not, not just by modern standards, he was large. Uh, he was 6'2 or 6'3, uh, you know, very robust, well over 200 pounds. Um, not fat, just a big man. And, and, and relative to the average height of that day, which was around 5'5 five, five or 5'6, five, he towered over his contemporaries. And that, you know, many, many contemporaneous writings refer to just his, his sheer presence. Uh, and we'll get into that. That was, that was one of his greatest gifts. And he, he learned how to maximize uh, that, that presence. So Washington, uh, he was a surveyor. He was kind of a young planter and farmer. Uh, and then he decided to join the colonial militia the, the way that the, the military uh, worked in those days, uh, the British, they had, um, there, there were really two, two entities that fought for the British in those days in the colonies. Uh, you had uh, British regular army officers uh, and soldiers in the Royal Army. Um, the officers had royal commissions, which back in the day was a very, very valuable thing. Um, you usually had to purchase a commission or have really strong connections, uh, and those commissions were highly coveted. Um, and, and importantly, the British were, were very hesitant to give those royal commissions to the colonists. They preferred to keep them in the colonial militia. They kind of looked down upon these, uh, these farmers with pitchforks, as they said uh, in the movie The Patriot. And, and that is a very accurate representation. Um, and we'll, we'll get into more of those details later, but it was a, a source of tension uh, throughout Washington's life. He had this chip on his shoulder because he was never offered a royal commission. If he was offered a royal commission, it's kind of one of those ironies of history. If he was offered a commission in the royal army, he would have taken it, and there is a chance that he would have fought. Uh, he would have fought, um, you know, as a as a royal officer, as a redcoat, 
um, with the British Army against, it, it's hard to say that he, he would have fought against his own countrymen. Uh, there were some uh, royal officers um, like, uh, like Charles Lee um, and like Horatio Gates, who's, who were royal officers who resigned their commissions to, to lead in the Continental Army. Um, but you never know. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to predict. It's hard to say what Washington would have done. Um, but he, he never gained that royal commission. He always served as an officer in the Virginia colonial militia. So he, he received a commission in the colonial militia as a captain. Uh, and one of his first missions, this is in the, the mid-1750s, um, you know, there were always, just to kind of set the stage, there were a lot of conflicts in early America between the British and the French. Um, and the, 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 the Indians uh, were kind of, um, you know, there were various different Indian tribes in the areas, and the, the British and the French were trying to establish their own colonial holdings. Um, you know, the, the colonies were very wealthy. There were lots of natural resources. Every, everyone understood the opportunities for westward expansion and land grabs um, and all of the, uh, the products that were produced there, uh, timber, tobacco, sugar, depending on where you were in the colonies, I mean, the, the colonies were very, they were very lucrative. They were very productive. And the, the French and the British wanted uh, more possessions in America. And so there were a lot of conflicts between the French and the British and the various Indian allies on both sides. So one of Washington's first missions in 1755 was to um, lead an expedition to um, disrupt or capture a French uh, raiding party that was rumored to be establishing a French fort uh, called Fort Duquesne, uh, which was in the frontier, think like Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Southern and Western Pennsylvania. This is where all of this took place. And so Washington, he, he, at a young age, uh, you know, kind of where uh, modern day Pittsburgh is located, um, you know, Washington became very familiar with this area. Um, so he, he led this this uh, colonial militia, an Indian uh, party to go disrupt this French force. And there's a very important incident that took place. Uh, Washington, uh, with his British troops or his colonial troops uh, and his French ally or, and his uh, Indian allies, they came upon this French party. And the details uh, are, are somewhat lost to history, but what happened was they found them in the night, they surrounded them, and things got out of hand, and a massacre took place. Um, all of the uh, French, uh, the, all the French soldiers uh, were captured. Uh, many of them were executed and scalped uh, by the Indians that were allied to uh, Washington's unit. And this, when, when word of this got out, it created a, a major international incident. Uh, the French were very upset about how their, their delegation was treated, uh, the, the execution and scalping and mutilation of the prisoners. And that was really the first incident that led to the wider French and Indian War that took place in the colonies and then later expanded into Europe and became the Seven Years' War uh, that took place from 1756 to 1763, uh, in mainland Europe. Uh, so you have to understand that the French-Indian War was the American theater of the larger Seven Years' War, uh, which took place in Europe and around the world. So that incident, um, you know, really uh, kind of gained, got Washington some early name recognition. Um, and then what happened was the French uh, sent a punitive expedition to go, uh, to go capture or kill Washington's force in retribution for this massacre. So Washington, uh, he heard this French party was coming to was coming to, to do this, and he decided to hold up and build a fort, which he named Fort Necessity. Now Washington, as we'll see throughout these three episodes, he was not a brilliant tactical battlefield commander. That's just the way. That, that's just the truth. Uh, he was not this amazing Napoleonic or Stonewall Jackson type of figure um, who had just amazing success always on the battlefield. Uh, there, there were always some limitations with his tactical leadership. And that was displayed at Fort Necessity. So he built this fort in the middle of the woods, Fort Necessity, and Washington failed to clear the surrounding, uh, the surrounding fields um, of trees and brush. And so what that did, that allowed the French and the Indians to get very close to Fort Necessity and lay siege to it um, without being exposed to defensive fire from Fort Necessity. So eventually, uh, Washington was forced to surrender at Fort Necessity, and there was some uh, there was some discussion amongst the French that he might be executed for what happened, um, you know, with that prior incident where where his uh, Indians executed and scalped uh, a lot of French. And 
Uh, Washington eventually was allowed to leave, but this you know kind of put a black mark on his record. And um, when he was you know when he was subsequently released uh, and rejoined the uh, colonial forces, he was demoted. Uh, he was removed from command of his uh, uh, colonial battalion. He was made a captain. Uh, but uh, this was a very important turning point in Washington's early life because then, um, you know, instead of kind of running home scared and, and defeated, uh, he decided to, to try to regain his honor. And what, what better way to regain your honor than to find a new fight and, and to show bravery and heroism, which is exactly what he did. Uh, he volunteered for a position on the staff of uh, British General uh, Braddock. General Braddock uh, led uh, kind of a, another expedition to go um, to go uh, destroy Fort Duquesne, avenge uh, the, the embarrassment of the Fort Necessity surrender. Um, and Washington was, he was an adjutant with, with General Braddock. And Braddock was, uh, he was a very, uh, he, he was a good man, but he was an incompetent commander. Uh, he did not take uh, the proper precautions. He did not understand the strength and the determination of the French and their Indian allies. And at the Battle of uh, Monongala, they were just they were ambushed and destroyed by a joint French and Indian force, and Braddock and most of their force was annihilated. Bra Braddock was killed, uh, and Washington uh, miraculously escaped. He fought very valiantly, um, you know, and, and just kind of a, a nice little anecdote from that. He wrote home to his mother and, and some of his friends afterwards, and he he stated that, um, you know, he he was he was describing the battle and his his survival. And he said, uh, you know, I've heard the whistle of bullets, and I confess there is something beautiful in the sound, something sweet in the sound of bullets. And that kind of echoes uh, a statement that Winston Churchill uh, said uh, later. You know, Winston Churchill fought in several early wars as a young man, and, and Churchill said something similar. Uh, he said, there is nothing greater in life than being shot at without result. Uh, I've always loved those quotes, and it really just showed that you know Washington was—he was a brave man. I mean, he he loved battle, uh, he loved uh, being a part of the military, he loved to fight, uh, and that was evident from from early on. And instead of being rewarded uh, for his heroism at the Battle of Mon Monongala, um, he did not really receive uh, the 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 accolades that he believed he was due. Uh, he was not uh, offered a royal commission. Uh, he was not even placed back in command of a uh, colonial militia battalion as he was at Fort Necessity. Um, he he re retained his rank as captain, um, and he, he felt this was a slight. Um, it, really, that was the two takeaways from his service in the French-Indian War. Number one, uh, he saw that the British Army was not as lethal and, and not as talented as many others uh, thought they were. Uh, at the time, the, the British had an extremely powerful navy, and their army was good. They were professional, but you know Washington knew, based on his service in the French Indian War, that they weren't as good as they were billed, um, and, and he never forgot that. And the other takeaway, number two, was that Washington always had a chip on his shoulder um, from you know being disrespected, from being looked down upon uh, by these British superiors who 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 just they, they looked at the militia as as inferior beings. They looked at them as not real soldiers. They looked at them as farmers with pitchforks, uh, and that was part of their arrogance and their overconfidence uh, towards the, um, the the Continental Army. Uh, they always saw them as just militia soldiers, uh, not real warriors, um, and, and that came back to bite them, obviously, in the American Revolution. So Washington, uh, he, he kind of resigns uh, in disgust from the colonial militia, and he goes back home to Virginia, uh, to Mount Vernon, to become a planter. And uh, he comes back home, and he runs for a seat in the uh, Virginia colonial legislature uh, called the House of Burgesses. Um, you know, he, as a war hero, he, he won election to the legislature, and he kind of became, as a young man at the age of 26, he became this kind of young and uh, up-and-coming figure, and uh, this was uh, greatly helped uh, by his marriage. So he married a woman named Martha Custis, uh, who was a, a young widow, who was about a year and a half older than him. She was 27. Uh, he was he had just turned 26, and they got married. So Martha Custis, uh, she had two children from her first marriage. Her husband had died, um, and she was a very wealthy widow who needed a protector and needed a father figure for her for her two young children. And George Washington was this kind of young, dashing uh, war hero, and there was a mutual attraction. They had a very happy marriage. Um, tragically, Martha Washington uh, later burned all of their correspondence, 
Uh, it, it's one all of their letters. Uh, it's kind of one of the great tragedies of history, uh, certainly from the historian's perspective, that she decided to burn all of their correspondence. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a mystery of history of why she did that, uh, what she was trying to do and protect. But um, so we, we don't have all of their letters. We have a few that survived, um, but we, we don't really know all the intimate details of their relationship. But what we do know is that it was very strong. It was very genuine. They came to love each other very dearly. Um, and it was a great partnership. Martha was very intelligent. She was very beautiful. Um, and it was a great marriage from the very beginning. And so Washington, uh, he becomes this major figure in colonial Virginia. Um, you know, he, uh, he decides to uh, embark upon the life of a planter. Um, and he was very successful. Um, he raised tobacco. Uh, he later uh, diversified his crops uh, into uh, wheat. Uh, he even created a distillery um, uh, to sell uh, alcoholic beverages, um, and, and he was just kind of one of these early uh, Virginia planter class um, um, uh, elites, so to speak, of Virginia. He was, he was one of the wealthiest men in Virginia. Uh, he was a big landowner, obviously, because he inherited the estates, not only of his wife, um, but he inherited the estates of his late father uh, and Lawrence, his older half-brother. And interestingly, we'll, we'll get into this later, but Washington, um, part of his management, um, the, the legal term was he was he had a dower interest in Martha Washington's estate, uh, the former Martha Custis, uh, and part of that estate included eighty-four slaves, and he he always kept uh, the the number of slaves around a hundred over the years. Um, but it's very important to note they weren't his slaves technically; they belonged to his wife. Um, he really had no authority to buy or sell additional slaves. Um, they were just seen, in the legal parlance of the day, they were property that he could only manage. So that's a, a, you know what you hear from modern historians and modern leftists who try to diminish the founding fathers, especially Washington. Oh, the evil slave owners. Well, in, in Washington's case, um, there was all, and I encourage you to read, especially Ellis's accounts of, of how he managed that, how he managed his estates, his farms. Uh, he was a very uh, he was a very good businessman, very good planter, um, but like many of the early colonists, um, he was very much in debt and he was very much uh, reliant upon trade with Great Britain. And those things began to come to a head uh, in the 1760s and particularly in the early 1770s um, as this tension between crown and colonies began to unravel, and thereafter events moved swiftly and unpredictably. Uh, obviously, Boston, Massachusetts, was the hotbed of revolutionary spirit. Um, it was less so uh, in the South, but it's important to note that Washington, was, he was always a revolutionary. He was always a radical. Um, you know, obviously, that, the, the dial kind of got turned up as the years went on, but he was not some kind of a Johnny-come-lately to the cause of independence. Uh, he was a strong believer that the, the, the crown was, was poorly managing the colonies, that the colonies could and should be independent, that they shouldn't be reliant upon the British. Uh, a lot of these wealthy planters felt they were taken advantage of by British tradesmen who charged them exorbitant rates for shipping and taxation, uh, and they were reliant on the British uh, for trading, and, and they were reliant on the British Navy for protection. And, and those things began to escalate, especially with the Boston Massacre in the early 1770s, um, then with the Boston Tea Party in 1773, as we all know, as we all learned as kids, uh, which then led to uh, the Stamp Act, uh, the Coercive Acts, uh, which were called by the colonists the Intolerable Acts. And these things led to the calling of the first Constitutional Congress in 1774, which Washington was one of the two delegates from Virginia uh, to Philadelphia for this first Constitutional Congress in late 1774. Now, this was kind of a jovial affair. Uh, obviously, independence was not talked of that much, uh, if at all, in, these er in this early Congress. Uh, the, the, the delegation, the Congress met uh, to kind of unify, to, to try to find some common interests, uh, to start to um, you know, come together and congeal as a unified body. Uh, the, these delegates realized that they were, they were stronger together. Um, they realized that um, you know, that they were never going to achieve uh, their goals if they acted as these kind of quasi-independent uh, 13 colonies. Um, so they decided to, to begin to take steps to unify. But again, as I said, things started to get uh, out of hand very, very quickly. And those things culminated with the, with the, the infamous or famous spark 
that started the American Revolution in April 1775, which was the first battle of Lexington and Concord. Now, that, that really changed everything. Now, we had open fighting between uh, the colony of Massachusetts and British regular troops um, that were sent there to enforce uh, the intolerable acts. Um, that's when the, the you know, quartering of British troops took place and all these taxes. Uh, it's also important to note, and I always laugh about this, that the American Revolution was really started over relative, I mean, compared to today, extremely moderate taxes. And, you know, we're talking about 1% or 2% on certain goods like stamps and paper products and tea and those things. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, look at today. I mean, we're, I mean, uh, half of our income essentially is stolen uh, by the government today, and we just sit back and take it. Anyway, um, so the, the American Revolution was kicked off in early 1775 in April uh, with the First Battle of Lexington and Concord. Um, the British were repulsed. It was an American victory, and um, what happened was the British retreated uh, with, the, with the army, uh, into Boston Harbor, into the city of Boston, uh, where they were protected by the Royal Navy. Navy, And this ragtag uh, bunch of uh, eight to 10,000 uh, continental troops uh, surrounded the city of Boston and began to lay siege to it. And that was the backdrop for the Second Continental Congress, which was called in the immediate aftermath of the revolution breaking out. Washington, again, was named as a delegate to the Second Continental Congress. And very importantly, this is a very important anecdote, Washington showed up to the Second Continental Congress wearing a military uniform. He had a special military uniform uh, made for him uh, by a tailor in Virginia. Obviously, he wasn't going to wear his, uh, his uniform of the uh, colonial militia, uh, but he wore a very impressive uh, blue uh, new military uniform just to signify to everyone that he was ready to go to war. And that, that point was well taken. Uh, at, the, at the Second Continental Congress, one of the first things that was done was uh, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin nominated George Washington to be the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Uh, obviously, he had this reputation as a war hero. He had fought with the British um, in the French-Indian War, um, and he had this reputation as a good soldier, as a good leader, and obviously he had this, this presence about him uh, that was very compelling and very inspiring. Uh, he was unanimously confirmed as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, uh, and he immediately uh, was sent to Boston uh, to take command of the army uh, that was then laying siege to the British troops uh, that were holed up in Boston. So I'm going to leave it there for this initial episode, part one. Um, uh, it's going to be a three-part series. I, I really hope that you'll tune in uh, to episodes two and three. As I, as I said before, episode two is going to focus on Washington's service uh, as Commander-in-Chief uh, of the Continental Army uh, during the American Revolution. And then Part 3 is going to be uh, the Articles of Confederation, the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, uh, and then uh, Washington's two terms as President of the United States. And be sure to uh, like this podcast, uh, give me a five-star review, share it with your friends. Uh, this thing is blowing up. We've got a lot of uh, really interesting things uh, in the works uh, that we'll hopefully be share with you later. Uh, this is Jake Beckett, host of The Jake Beckett Show, and we'll see you next time for part two of His Excellency George Washington.